Uh, we're starting again a brand new two-week mini-series called Made for More. And for all that our city's been through, I mean, 100 years we've never experienced this, and really we've never experienced this, two hurricanes within 21 days, and really you'd say three hurricanes uh, within 40 days, um, our, our city is uh, been, it's gone through a lot. And uh, I think for the next few weeks, God has really given me a mantle to talk a little bit about this, this idea called mental health. So why are we talking about mental health? Well, if you don't know this, in the last 10 years, mental health is actually, or epidemics of mental health, is on the rise by 13%. Scholars tell us that one in five people walking this planet will have a mental health episode, a breakdown of anxiety or depression or suicidal thoughts. And I realize that, pastoring you, I realize that. And there's a lot that you experience that we help try to come alongside and help you. And the reason why, I'm going to pray in just a moment, but the reason why there is, is because there is what we call an attack. There is an attack on our mind. See, the battle is won in the mind. And today, I want to give you the tools and the, the wherewithal to get the power of change so that you win the battle in in the mind. And our theme verse, and then I'm going to pray, our theme verse for this mini two-week series is in Thessalonians. Thessalonians, and the Bible says this, may the God of peace set you apart, that there is a God of peace that we serve. He doesn't just have peace, he is peace. Jehovah Nisi, the banner of God is the God of peace, has set you apart for himself. May every part of you, every part of us, we're a triune being. May your spirit, that's the redeemable side of you, your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions, and your body, which is the flesh suit, may it be complete. So there is a way for you to win the battle in your mind, to win it, to win your thought life. There is a way. In fact, the Bible tells us that we can win it. The triune being of ourself, our body, soul, and spirit, we can win. We can be in completeness with God. May you be without blame when our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Let me pray. Father, we invite your presence in here. This is going to be a heavy next two weeks as we dig up the turmoil of some of our past, some of the things that we're wrestling with. I thank you that you're the God of our past, you're the God of our present, and you're for sure the God of our future. So we ask you to minister to our souls, all three parts of us, our mind, our will, and our emotion, in Jesus' name. And everybody said... So grab your notes. If you're watching online, you can actually uh, click right below me. The notes are there. If you're in this room, you can actually go to the sound booth or grab a piece of paper. But let me open up by asking this question. And this is for everybody. I want you to answer this in your mind today. Have you ever, have you ever had thoughts come into your mind that you never intended them to be there? Have you ever had a thought come into your mind and when that thought went to your mind, you went, dang it, I didn't want to think that. How did that thought get there? See, there is an attack on our mind that the battle is won and lost in our thought life, in our minds, the transformation of our minds. Let me give you a few realities about this attack on our mind. If you're taking notes, just kind of gotta get us going here, prime the pump a little bit. A few realities. Number one about this attack of our mind is the attack of the mind is actually real. According to the Bible, which is God's word, we believe it's the inspired word of God. According to the Bible, the battle of our mind is not fictitious. It's not something made up. It's not just for a select group of people. According to the Bible, every single person walking this planet is under attack from the enemy in our mind. First Peter chapter 5 tells us this. It says, for, to be alert. And to be sober mind. Now, typically when we think of being sober, we think of not being addicted to alcohol or not being under the influence or to be drunk with alcohol. And yes, it is that, but it's anything. Being drunk with alcohol or being addicted to pain pills or to being addicted to gambling or being uh, addicted to your spouse or codependent on work. And the, the Bible actually tells us that there's no way for you to win the battle in your mind if you're not of soberness. Your enemy, your devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Verse 9, here is our goal. We know there's an enemy. We know there's a devil. We know somebody's coming against us. We know he wants to attack us. Attack us. So what do we do? We resist him. Resist him. 
standing firm in the faith because we know that there is a family of faith of brothers and sisters throughout the world going through the same thing that we are going through. Listen to me. Let me just tell you the first thing. The first thing that the enemy wants to convince you of is you're the only one going through it. I'm the only one. Nobody else is going through this struggle. Nobody else has suicidal thoughts. Nobody else is depressed. Nobody else is anxious. Nobody else lost during the hurricanes. Nobody lost like I did. Nobody's marriage is like this. And the moment the devil has you convinced that you're the only one walking through, you're walking through, he has got you on the hook. He's got you. Millions of people, billions of people walking this planet, they are battling the same thing. The attack on our mind and our thought life. It's a real deal. It's not something made up. Your friend's not made it up. Your spouse hasn't made it up. Your kids haven't made it. It's real. Here's the second thing. Just few realities about this whole attack in our mind. Number two is we are not living in a neutral world. We're not living in a neutral world. That you are not a part of a country club. You have joined an army and we are in battle. Every day when you get up, you're in battle. There are no neutral places that you go. School isn't neutral. Driving to church isn't neutral. Sitting in church isn't neutral. Being at family dinner isn't neutral. There is no neutral places in your life. Everywhere you go, you're at battle. Your office is a battlefield. Classroom is a battlefield. The, the website you go to online is a battlefield. The roads you drive on. Come on, I-4 drivers. It's a battlefield. The grocery store is a battlefield. The TV the news channels that you watch, the election, everything is a battle. Here's why I say that to you. The devil wants to convince you that if you go into these environments and you can name them, then you're okay, you can let your guard down. I want to tell you there is no place you go on this planet where you can let your guard down. You are in a battle. I know this sounds a little cliche, but there are no safe places from the devil. You could be in your word and be attacked by the devil. You could be in a worship service and being attacked. There are no neutral places in this world where you're safe from the devil's attack. I wish you'd be more positive. I'm positive he's coming after you. Here's the third thing. Is the battle is literally played out in our mind before it's played out in our life. In essence, if we win the battle in our mind, we win the battle in our life. If you lose the battle in your mind, you lose the battle in life. So if we can take every thought captive, and if we can understand we've been transformed by the power and the renewing of our mind, then we will win. In fact, I want to always give credit where credit is due. I read a book a few years ago. A lot of what I'm giving you today is in a book, what I think probably top five preachers walking the planet today. Her name is Joyce Meyer. And Joyce Meyer wrote a book called The Battlefield of the Mind. Highly recommend this book. Because in this book, what she says is what happens in our mind affects everything else. The battle is won or lost in the mind. And I'm going to explain it as we get going today. Anytime you see the word mind, I want you to repeat it with me. I'm going to read a couple scriptures with you. Be alert and of sober mind. mind. Be alert. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Yeah, your mind. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. For you were taught with regard to your former ways to put off the old self. You went into the grave, we talked about that a few weeks ago, and you came out a brand new person, which is being corrupted by the deceitful desire to be made new in our attitude of our what? minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in righteousness and in holiness. Do you have time for one more? Colossians chapter 3. Set your what? Minds on things above, not on earthly things. Over 100 times in the Bible, the Bible is trying to convince you that if you set your minds on heavenly things, your mind off of earthly things, you will win the battle. And if your mind is on this earth, you will lose the battle nine times out of ten. Every day we go to war. Every day we're in battle. Every day there's a choice that we make. Will we, be, will we succumb to our thought life or will we allow the Holy Spirit to intervene and to win this battle for, else, for us? Now, there is no question, church, 
as we look at our world today, that this mental health thing is an issue in our world today. And I don't know what you come in with experiencing. I don't know what medication you're on and I don't know what disorder you've been diagnosed from, but I want you to know this. We can win this battle. According to the Bible, we are not unequipped to go into this battle that is set before us. God's word, his Bible, his people, and everything in it has positioned us in such a place that we don't just survive, that we can thrive, and we can win, and the enemy wants us to believe the opposite, and if you believe the opposite, then you've lost the battle already. Let me give you a few. And some of you are right here. We will always struggle. I will never be free. I will always be a prisoner to these thoughts. This is how it will always be. I never choose the right person. I will always be a failure. I will always be not enough. I will always have this ailment. This addiction will be something I struggle with forever. To the point, listen to me, church, to the point that we have popularized and we've accepted the idea that mental health is a crutch in our American society. So we say things like this. Well, anxiety is just my thing. It'll just be my thing that I'll battle with depression. It's my generation. I will always struggle with this. It's a generational curse on my family. My mom had it. My sister had it. It's just going to be my struggle. And we say things like, this is just how it's going to be for me. Now, before we go any further, let me just dismiss dismiss the the myth, if I can talk today. Dismiss the myth that I don't believe in hereditary things and chemical things. I do. There are people in this room and people in the kingdom that need, there's a chemical imbalance. There are people in this room that have hereditary things that were passed down. Fetal alcohol syndrome, just to name one. What I want you to know today, no matter where you find yourself in the mental health battle, I want you to know that God never intended you to live under the banner of this is my struggle and that's what I endure in this life. Never. I said it already in Thessalonians. God will, God wants to, and God desires to heal your triune being, your body, your soul, and your spirit. So what's more important, divine healing or modern medicine? Well, I like to to answer this way. I remember when my mother-in-law got cancer. I'll never forget it. She got cancer, and when she got cancer, here's what we did. We prayed for divine healing that God would heal her from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet and that cancer would be removed from her body in Jesus' name. We had people prophesying over. We had people laying on hands. We had people anointing her with oil. We had all, we were divinely welcoming the presence of God while simultaneously saying, God, the method doesn't matter, but what matters is the means. So God, if you use modern medicine or divine power, we welcome whatever you do. So we did chemotherapy and we did radiation and we prayed for divine healing. And in this day and age, three years later, or today, three years later, she's healed and set free. You say, well, what set her free? Divine healing or chemotherapy? God did it. So it's not one or the other. So so listen, just because somebody is bipolar or somebody battles depression doesn't mean they are possessed by a demon. There may simply just be a chemical imbalance for them. However, it doesn't mean they always have to have that. Just because you're on that medication doesn't mean you always have to be on that medication. And just because you're not on medication doesn't mean you have to be on medication. And just because you're on it doesn't mean you have to come off of it. We have to be welcome. We have to welcome the presence of God to divinely heal us while using the modern medicine he's provided for us today. Amen? So this is a dynamic website. It's not complete yet, uh, but we are, we, are, we are creating what we're calling a soul care page. 
So you can scan the QR code. We're just now developing. I threw it on our team like three days ago. So on this page is going to have podcasts and sermons and book recommendations and Christian counselors and uh, doctors that we recommend. That's going to be on this page. So you're going, you can go there now, but it's not perfect yet. You can go on there and you'll be able to go to wellspringfl.com slash soul help and get all the information that you need. This is going to continue to grow. There's going to be worksheets on there and, and uh, scoring that you can do and testing that you can do and health quizzes that you can do so you can determine where you are at. Amen? Can I double click on this a little bit further? So there are three enemies that we face every single day. I mentioned these briefly a couple weeks ago. I'm going to unpack them, but let me give them to you real quick. Number one is we face the enemy of this world. We face the enemy of our flesh, and we face the enemy of the devil. Every single day when you get up, you are in a battle, and you will face these three enemies. They are very real, and they are very present. And every day that you live, you will be attacked in different ways by the world, by the flesh, and of the devil. Let me show you the world. Just one verse for each one of these, and then I'm going to keep driving. The world. Jesus said this. I have told you these things that in me you may have what? Peace. Jesus said this. In this world, you will have trouble. Well, I wish you'd be more positive. Well, you're going to have trouble. Tell you what you won't see is this on a plaque at Hobby Lobby. (laughs) And if you're in this room and you've got the brilliant idea of I'm going to create it, then just add the next three words. But take heart. Take heart. Take heart. Jesus said, I have overcome this world. You're going to battle the world. You're going to battle the news. You're going to battle culture. You're going to come up against culture in your schools and in your workplaces and things you must sign and things you must, you got to adapt to the culture. There are going to be things that you wrestle with as you walk in this plane and you walk in this world. And that's not changing and it's actually going to be harder. Well, why is God letting that happen? He promised it 2,000 years ago. You're also going to battle this flesh, this flesh suit. Let me show it to you in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. For you are still of the flesh. So we have this flesh suit. So just because we get saved, we are signed, sealed, and delivered, and heaven is our home, doesn't mean we get this flesh removed from us. That'd be weird and creepy, would it not? Skeletons walking around, right? We still have this flesh suit. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, you, although you have flesh, You are not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way. Each one of us has this flesh suit from the the very beginning of time. From the fallen Genesis, this flesh suit has wrecked havoc in our world. Making it feel good and making it feel right and making it happy. We battle with it. And you will battle with your flesh till the day that you die. There's also this devil, Satan himself. So for our struggle is not against flesh. Well, hold on, Pastor. You just said we have a battle and it's flesh. Well, it's a different kind of flesh. See, what Paul was telling the church at Ephesus is he was saying, hey, your issue is not you need another political leader or you need another party in place. See, that's, does that sound like today? Come on, church. Well, we need another this and we need another this and we need another this and we need another this. Paul was reminding the church at Ephesus, you don't battle against the other party. You don't battle against the other person. Your battle is not against flesh and blood. Your battle is against this flesh, your flesh. Rulers against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. There's a really real spirit That's at war against you every single day and God wants you to not be unaware or be surprised about the schemes of the devil. Let me show it to you. 2 Corinthians verse two. In order that Satan might not outwit you or win the battle in your mind, we are not to be unaware of his schemes. See, we see this throughout Jesus' ministry. He's dealing with the spirit realm. He's constantly casting out demons and dealing with impure spirits. We see it all throughout the scripture. Specifically in Mark chapter five, Jesus encounters this demon-possessed man. He's on the other side of Lake Gennesaret or Lake Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee. And he's on the other side of the lake. And as he's on the other side of the lake, they hear him wailing. He's got all these demons. Scholars say somewhere between 600 demons were inside of this man. That sounds like mental health to me. So what does Jesus do? Jesus cast out 
that demonic presence. Let me show it to you. And here's what happened in Mark chapter 5. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons, 600, sitting there. But now, no longer is he demon possessed. Now, he's in his, there it is again, he's in his right mind. So let me help you theologically, and I don't want to linger here too long because I don't want to bore you. But I need you to know that we do not believe at Wellspring, we not believe, do not believe that a Christian can be demon possessed. So the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, cannot be in the same place that another spirit is in. So the body cannot house the Holy Spirit and the demonic spirit. Let me show it to you. Colossians chapter 3. He has delivered us from the domain of the darkness and he has transferred us. So no longer are we possessed by the demon. We're transferred to us into the kingdom of God and we are his beloved sons. Let me show you one more. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do you not know that your bodies, they're for another purpose. It's now, as a Christian, it's the temple of the Holy Spirit, not a demonic spirit. Who is in you? And if the Holy Spirit is in you, then no other spirit can be in you. Whom you have received from God, you are not your own. So let me illustrate it this way to you. I think this will help. How many of you have ever had, or you know somebody that's been, had the virus called the flu? How many of you ever had the flu, flu virus? Or you know somebody that's had the flu? Yeah, mo- most of us, if not all of us, have had it or know somebody that's had it. And what happens when you have the flu? You have symptoms, and those symptoms are manifested on the outside. So you get chills, and um, you get nauseous, and you get hot, and you uh, get a fever, and you, you shake a little bit. There's these symptoms that come out of you because there's a flu virus inside of you. Do you understand that? But when it comes to the Christian realm, if I can illustrate it this way to you, uh, this blanket is the flu. And as a Christian, what happens is I take this blanket and I throw this blanket on me. Now, if I did that and I turned on these lights, these lights are really bright and hot. And I turned off the air conditioning and I put it at 80 degrees, the heat in here. What happens? I, I, would, I would have the symptoms of the flu. I didn't eat this morning and so I would get hot. My, by the way, my neck is getting warm right now just with this blanket on me. I would get the chills. I would be nauseous. Why? Why, because the flu is in me? No, be, but because the flu is on me. The symptoms of the flu are on me. And so what happens so many times as Christians, you're getting prayed out of you what was never in you. You don't have a demon in you. You have a demon on you. So the symptoms are on you. So the goal is not to pray that demon out of you, it's to pray the demon off of you. It's it's like this, it's like what happens, how do we counteract the devil's schemes? We go into the closet and we, get, we put on, listen to me, the garment of praise. It's a garment that we wear. So for many of you, you've got the symptoms of the flu, so you think you have the flu, but you don't have the flu. You just have flu symptoms because it's on you. You're hot and you're heavy. So we don't believe that as a Christian you can be demon-possessed, but we do believe that you can be demon-oppressed, that the devil can be on you. His schemes are on you. Let me show it to you in Galatians 5. For it is freedom that Christ has set you free. So stand firm then and do not let yourself be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. This is a burden. It's a yoke of slavery. Listen, you've been set free. Listen, you've been set free. Christ has set you free. He's given you the Holy Spirit. But some of you are walking around with the burden of the demonic presence. And you're like, I gotta get this demon out of me. And I'm trying to show you a perfect illustration. That's a little arrogant, isn't it? It's probably not perfect. But I think it is. Of what it looks like. It's not in you. You don't have to pray it out of you. It's on you. So we gotta get the heaviness off of us. It's too heavy, you cannot bear it. You have been set free. So stop being burdened by the yoke of the demonic presence. 
Do you understand? So as you walk this world, you're, there are three demons, that, there are three forces that are against you. The world, the flesh, and the devil. You are a triune being. We said it in Thessalonians that God wants to heal your actual body, your actual soul, and your actual spirit. So many of us, we have body issues. There's a chemical makeup in our body that needs to be addressed with professional help or even medication. So just because somebody battles with bipolar or depression does not mean that they're demon-possessed. It means that there's a chemical imbalance. But it also doesn't mean that the divine power of God can heal them of that. So what I want you to know today is this. We can win this battle. We are not unequipped. God has equipped us. And so with the last few minutes I have, I want to give you the weapons that you have at your disposal to win the battle in your mind. And it's, it's, it's easier said than done. I get it. It's easy to believe in this church house. But when you walk out, that's where the rubber meets the road. But let me show it to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 10, sorry. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. There's worldly weapons. We don't have them. We don't fight with those weapons. The weapons we fight with are the weapons of the uh, are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they are divine power. We have divine power to demolish strongholds. Let me show you verse six. Here are our weapons. We demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive and we make it obedient to Christ. The battle is in our mind. Did you see it? God gave us the method. He actually gave us in this verse, he gave us three ways to fight the battle in our mind. Let me give them to you. Number one is we can demolish the arguments. What do we mean by arguments? Well, we saw it in verse five. We actually what? We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. So what's an argument? How do we fight this argument? What do you mean by argument? Well, let me tell it to you. This is the Greek definition of argument when the Bible says it. You ready for it? A very loud noise that yells and screams at us against God's truth. That sounds like mental health. So we demolish arguments by realizing that there is a voice and it's a loud voice, and it's screaming against us God's truth. And it's called the spirit of doubt. It happened in the Garden of Eden. It's happened in every environment that you've been in. Did God say, is God true? Is God alive? Is God right? Is God giving me the truth? Is God available? Did God leave me? And then it says, in every pretension. It's interesting, that word. But in the Greek, the word pretension is this. This is fascinating to me. It's an allegation of doubtful value. That's mental health. It sounds like mental health. It's the devil's strategy. God's word exposes it. This is a lie. I'm not believing it. I'm not trusting what I feel. So how do we conquer this? How do we demolish every argument. We must make a declaration list. Now, you've never heard of this before, so I'm gonna help you. A declarational list says this, this is the lie, and this is the truth, and you write it down. I'm gonna help you with a few. You won't have time to write these down, but I just wrote mine down. These are mine, okay? So today, here's my declarational list. Today, I will not live in fear because I have a tendency to live in fear. The declarational statement is, I'm not going to live in fear. I will approach every challenge with faith because God says that his perfect love casts out all fear. Do you see it? Changes my spirit right there. Changes it. Immediately changes it. Here's another one. Today, I will not live with a negative outlook. Not going to do it. But I'm going to have a positive one. Why? Why am I not going to be negative? Why am I going to be positive? Why? Because God's word says that I am his precious son or daughter and I am made in his image and he has good plans for me. Boom, my spirit changes. Now here's the one I battle with every day. Maybe you're like me. 
It's a declarational list. Today, I'm not going to believe I'm not good enough. Every day, Joey Atkins battles that I'm not good enough for April, I'm not good enough for Dakota, Liam, and Layla, and I'm not good enough for Wells. It's a battle every day in my life. Every day I battle with it. That I'm just not good enough. Every day I get up and I quote this. Because God's word says that I don't stand on my own righteousness, but I stand on his righteousness alone. Do you see it? We gotta demolish the strongholds. Demolish the arguments. This loud screaming voice inside of our heads saying that it lies and there aren't truth. Here's the second one. Is we must take every thought captive. Every thought captive. Verse five and six. We saw it already, but let me show it to you again. And we take every thought captive and we make it obedient to Christ. The Greek word to take it captive is actually the, the Greek phrase to make it a prisoner. See, you know what Paul is telling the church today? Paul is telling the church, you don't have to be a prisoner to your thoughts. We can have dominion over them. In Jesus' name and by the help, help of the Holy Spirit, we can win the battle in our minds. So how do we do it? We identify the lie and we pull down the truth. We identify the lie. The lie is I am not good enough, but I pull down the truth. I identify the lie. You can't just dismiss the lie. The lie, I tell people all the time, you can argue facts, you can't argue feelings. You can argue facts all day. Well, the fact is they showed up at three, but how I feel about when they showed up, you can't argue that because they're my feelings. So don't argue the feeling. The feeling is you don't feel good enough. Don't dismiss it. Recognize it. I'm not good enough. And immediately when I have that, I pull down the truth. Let me show you a few more. Some of you right now, you go, I'm just stupid. I'm just so stupid. I should have never married this person. I should have never done this business. I should have never started again. I thought I was good. It was so dumb. I should have never done it. I'm dumb. I'm stupid. I'm a moron. So I'm going to take that thought captive. And I'm going to say, no, no, it's a lie. And the truth is, I'm beautifully and I'm wonderfully made. Why? Because I'm made in the image of God. Here's another lie somebody's believing in the room today. Nothing's ever going to go right for me. It just seems like everything goes wrong. Now that's what you feel. It's the lie. So now we pull the truth down. Take it, Captain. We're going to pull the truth. And it's going to take more than one time. You're going to say it every day. Multiple times an hour, multiple times a day. Here's the truth. The truth is simply this. That's a lie. And the truth is I'm God's son or daughter and my father has good things in store for me. I am blessed. I am highly favored. I am chosen. I am redeemed. I am forgiven in Jesus' name. Jesus' blood covers me today and I'm healed in heaven, not hell. And I'm an overcomer by the blood of the lamb and the word of my testimony. Oh, I feel better. Why? Because I identified the lie and I pulled down the truth. Here's what I hear so many people say. Well, I'm just too busy. I'm just too overwhelmed. I got too much going on. I'm just too overwhelmed. No, 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 listen to me. This is a lie. You're not too overwhelmed and just giving up and throwing in the towel. There's way too many people walking this planet. We've experienced it twice in the last month in our church where two people have thought this statement and they've committed suicide. Just this month, two. Is the feeling real? Yes. But we must counteract it with the truth. Pull down the truth. And the truth is, he has given me everything I need for life and godliness, and it is found in Jesus Christ. I take every thought captive. First John 4, 4. You, dear children, are from God. And you've overcome them because the word, the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. What's the alternative? What's the alternative to this? Just be depressed? Just pop more pills? Just let the flesh lead? Just let the devil win? Just remain depressed and discouraged and defeated for the rest of your life? No, we're gonna fight. We're gonna fight for divine healing over our life or we're gonna fight that God will give us the right doctor and the right thing and the right that and the right this. However we want, we are not right and we want to be right and we will win. 
But there's a third one. And the third one says this, that we will be, we're going to be ready. Notice it doesn't say that if the devil comes or if the schemes of the devil come or if the devil comes. No, it, it, he's coming. He's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And what I want you to do today is to be ready, to be ready. Let me show it to you. Verse 5 and 6. And we take captive every thought, okay? We, we, we identify the lie, we pull down the truth, and we make obedient to Christ. And then, and then when we do that, we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. To punish every act of disobedience is what God wants. Everything has set itself up against God's best, and it must be Punish. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, knew that there would be a battle. And this is how I fight my battles. Oh, and this is how. This is how I fight my battles. I don't know how you fight your battles. And it may look like I'm surrounded by the enemy. Oh, but I'm surrounded by you. And in a moment of worship, in a moment of identity, in the moment of truth, I know who I am in Christ. I don't have to worry. I don't have to wonder. Even though I'm in battle, I am ready. And this is how I fight my battles. Come on, let's declare it. Let's declare it from the top of the roof. 